In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about how the ancients used to think of gods and their relationship to human beings. We, we do have a social cognitive platform, intellectual platform, which means that our primary categories, the primary categories of our mind, do seem to be social. So, you could say that the reason our mind evolved, or, or no, you could say that the fundamental selecting pressures on our, on our mind ensured that the, the primary substructure of our cognitive ability was modules that could understand social behavior. Men could understand women, women could understand men, men and women could understand children, children, men and women could understand the social world. And that's, and that's, that's what we're specialized for. And then it was only after those systems developed, hyper-developed, probably under the, uh, under the force of sexual selection, that they became able to separate themselves to some degree from that underlying social cognitive structure and start to see the world in ways that weren't personified. So, but what that means is that our natural categories are still anth anthropomorphic and dramatic. And it actually turns out that they work. So, Absu and time out. Nature and culture is a, a perfectly reasonable way of thinking about them. Now they would say, well, it's the interplay between nature and culture that gives rise to the, the primordial forces of nature. Now those forces of nature would be to some degree external, like a storm or like fire, but they would be to some degree internal too, like, like the fire of passion, right? And the, and the storm of sorrow, because those are natural forces as well. And one of the things that the ancients knew was that man was created to serve the gods. And of course, modern people think of that as a superstition, but that's because they don't really understand how archaic people thought. Archaic people thought like Freud thought. It's like, yeah, yeah, you have an ego, fine, you know, and as long as you're in a box within a bunch of other boxes, the ego runs things. But as soon as we put you somewhere where those boxes are gone, it's the underlying forces of nature that run you, hunger, thirst, you know, aggression, sexuality, and all those things that are impersonal, because of course you have them and you have them and so does everyone else, so they're impersonal and transcendent, and they're also eternal. And so when the ar ar archaic people said, and they usually said this with sorrow, that man was destined to serve the gods, that's what they meant. They meant that we were the playthings of these unbelievably powerful primordial forces that manifested themselves within our lives and determined our destinies. And in, 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 in fact, the Mesopotamians said that specifically about the elder gods. They said they were, they, they were part of that which determined human destiny. They, the Marduk, who we'll talk about in a while, was given the tablet of destinies because when he, was, when he asked to become top god, he said, well, if I'm going to be top god, I get to determine the destinies. And Well, we'll get to that. So, you, you kind of got to know what these, what these archaic gods were. And they were personalities. You know, and you could say, well, yeah, yeah, maybe it's a mistake to attribute the qualities of personality to a storm. <coughs> Although, it depends on what you think a storm is. Like, a modern person would think of a storm as an objective event that you have subjective reactions to. An archaic person would more likely think of the storm as the subjective consequences of the storm plus the storm all at once they wouldn't make that separation so it's a lot easier to personify something under those conditions or to not to personify it but to but to stay within the realm of conceptualization that makes it a personified force so the storm god is something that you know that can instill terror into your heart it's like well you know yeah fair enough 